Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. This is a special episode of the podcast because this is Tough Girl Extra. So what that means is that we've gone back to speak with one of our favorite guests, the awesome Anna McNuff. This is raw. This is unedited. You get to hear it all. We're going to be catching up with Anna as she shares more about her European cycling adventure directed by social media, her incredible adventure cycling the Andes with Faye Shepherd. Anna also shares more about the Adventure Queens, becoming an ambassador for the Girl Guide, and as well as updating us on her next book. Enjoy. So we are back speaking with Anna McNuff, the adventurer, the speaker, and the mischief maker. Hi, Anna. Hello, how are you doing? I am so well. It's so great to get to speak to you again, because I think it was, it must have been a year ago now when we first spoke, or maybe even a little bit longer than a year. I feel, yeah, I feel like it's been longer. It's definitely been quite a long time. It is high time we got some chatting in. Absolutely. And Anna, you've just been off like all over the world doing these different adventures and challenges. So I want to basically hear all about what you've been up to since we last spoke. So in our last episode, we obviously we covered your incredible cycle ride around America and we discussed, you know, running the full length of New Zealand. But what have you been up to since then? Oh, goodness me. Since then, uh, I'm not sure if when we last spoke, whether I'd done the social media ride across Europe, uh, which was... have done that. No, so yeah. No. So yeah, I, I, I spent a month cycling across Europe directed by social media, which was uncomfortable, but amazing. Um, and then I guess the biggest trip is I went and spent six months pedaling through the Southern Andes with a friend of mine called Faye Shepherd. And uh, that's probably been the most major thing. And then I've recently just got back from spending three months in a camper van going across uh, Canada. So that was pretty cool as well. Oh my God, they all sound amazing. So let's let's be logical then. So let's yes. start at the social media experiment, the, the social media ride across Europe. So where did this idea spring from? Well, that's it. It was definitely an experiment. You've got that one right. I started to think about how I'd been doing journeys that had challenged me physically. And I thought there are loads of different ways to challenge yourself. I know you're all about the challenges, tough girl challenges, of course. Um, And after New Zealand, it pushed me to a place in my my, where my mind was so fragile that I just started to think about like I always think of uh, you as a person you've got this kind of solid circle in the middle which is the part of yourself that you know and you understand and you're comfortable in that and then around the edges there's all these kind of fuzzy bits and they're really really uncomfortable if you go and explore them but I find that over time that little tiny solid circle gets bigger when you absorb the fuzzy bits and the uncomfortable bits And so I started thinking about what happens if I do a trip where I sort of explore the edges of myself and being a planner, I, I love to plan and I'm quite aware that it's something that not everyone does, especially when it comes to adventures. And so I thought, well, why don't I do a trip where I don't actually plan and I see what happens and it coincided with me thinking, do you know what? I've done all these big adventures miles away from home. I've been to the other side of the world, for goodness sake, and I've hardly seen any of Europe. And I thought, that's ridiculous. So I decided that I would set aside a month in my diary. I had a, a month between two speaking gigs. And I thought, right, I'm going to leave my my back garden in London, Brixton, where I was living at the time. I'm going to climb over my back fence because I didn't have a gate, so I just climbed over. And I'm going to leave it open to social media. So every two days, I threw up a post that said left, right or straight on. Here we go. I've got a month. Where am I going? And uh, that's what happened. Oh my God, I can feel like my heart rate starting to increase just because I am definitely a planner and I like being organized and I like to know where I'm going. I like to know that I'm on the right path, whether that's on a challenge or just in life in general. So yeah, that just sounds uncomfortable it, it but was, scary oh, it's scary and that's exactly why I did it and and the thing is I mean I love I love it I love being a planner because I think planning is like double the excitement because you get excited before you go because I get excited of what it's possibly going to be like and then you get excited while you're there and it's double excitement but um I yeah it was definitely uncomfortable and 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 one of the things is what was so it came at a point in my life where everything uh, was was transient so when I left when I left when I, I climbed out of my back gate I'd handed in the notice on my house I'd just given up my final few days of um, corporate marketing work uh, so I had no clear direction in my adventure 
I had no idea how I was going to earn money when I came home. I had nowhere to live. And so the first two days were really exciting because I had some friends with me. And then after that, the friends all left me and it just hit me. And I thought, what am I doing? And I had this meltdown. I cried my eyes out on a dual carriageway in Essex. And, uh, and I thought, this the walk I'd started off walking and it wasn't quite working for me and I just thought I I'm at such a point in my life where I feel like I need some movement I need I need to go faster this walking thing is too slow for me at that point I was at in my life where everything was so up in the air and so I thought oh can I switch to a bike I don't know is that really bad I've just told everyone I'm going to walk and uh, in fact everyone loved it so I called my mate Stace he went and brought my touring bike to me on the outskirts of Essex and I carried on on a bike and everything got a lot better from that point on what was it like, you know, the social media post when you put it up, sort of saying left, right, straight on? I mean, how long did you give it before you got your answer? Well, I'd give it, I'd let it run out for about 24 hours normally. And what was amazing is that everyone kept bringing their their own experiences and their memories to my journey so when I got closer towards um when I was in Germany actually I was posting about whether I potentially wanted to go to Vienna then people were posting pictures of them in Vienna from years gone by and saying oh you have to go there I had this amazing experience so people were getting very very animated and very passionate about why I should go to a certain place and it was quite nice because I felt like it was giving them a chance to relive their memories as well as kind of be a part of my own adventure and obviously I had some element of control so I had to choose what the three options were um so I did I did have one team there was there was a group of guys that were trying to send me north and it was February at this point and I only had my bivy bag and they were they were hell-bent on sending me to Finland and um and so after about two weeks and I was in the Netherlands I started just giving options that were either straight along east or south because I said I'm not going north that's just not fun and they were so disappointed um but yeah mostly it was just it was but what I realized that was quite funny is that all I did was pla- shrink my planning cycle down from usually I plan a week ahead to just planning in two day cycles so I was kind of throwing up the post planning two days ahead and that made me feel more comfortable with it being a little bit more unplanned. Was there ever a point where you really had your heart set on going somewhere whether it was Vienna and they sort of said nope you're going left instead of right or you know I wanted to go and see the monkeys in the Netherlands, right? There was this, there was this, <laughs> that was the only one. I missed the monkeys. Um, but I, I, I was in the far, the far east of the Netherlands and there was one place that would take me to go and see this monkey palace and I got voted to go south and I was really gutted, but I just had to let it go. But, but that's the only memory I have. And actually what it showed me, and I kind of live my life like this anyway, is you, you generally, if you're a kind of a focused, you know, happy person, you don't think about the roads you didn't take. I think all you're doing is focusing on what are the new roads coming in front of you and what the new opportunities are from the the path you have decided to take. And so for me, it it really showed me that actually I didn't dwell on on missed opportunities because I thought, well, you know, I can't be getting fear of missing out FOMO about what's going on over there because this is awesome in front of me. You know, I'm cycling alongside the river, the Rhine River and there's castles and everything. And um, yeah, it was amazing. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and that's such a great way of looking at it. Because I think sometimes you can almost stand when you've got these options with like this indecision, like which way do I go? Is, is that fear of missing out? Um, but actually, sometimes you've got to appreciate the, the path that you're on, the journey that you're going on. Def- yeah, definitely. I was going to ask, how did it work sort of accommodation wise? And you've recently just uh, sent a tweet, not that I'm stalking you, basically saying you just (laughs) updated your profile on warm showers. Um, But when you were traveling throughout Europe, were you while camping? Were you in your bivy bag? Were you staying with friends, strangers? How, How was that working for you? Yeah, I intended to stay in my bivy bag because I just thought I love the simplicity of it. I thought, great, if I've got everything with me, then I'll just, I'll just, I, I don't, you know, I'd have to worry about getting to a certain place each night and that would take the pressure off. But what actually happened was uh, after a few nights of bivying, I bivied while I was in the UK. And then once I got on the ferry to, uh, I went to the Netherlands, um, I, I thought I remembered warm showers and I thought, oh, that's that's quite cool. And um, and so I started looking on there and seeing just but it's quite difficult because I didn't know where I was going. So I was kind of roughly looking. And then what actually started to happen is because it was a social media trip, 
people on social media just started getting in touch. They, they were sending me screen grabs of where they lived in the Netherlands and doing big circles and saying things like bitter Balen here and pointing. And, um, and so sometimes that became part of the options for people. So if, if someone had sent me a random message saying, I live in the Black Forest, you have to come and I'll buy you a whole Black Forest Gatto, I'd say, right, guys, someone in the, in the Netherlands has offered me Black Forest Gatto, like in, in Germany, sorry, at that point. Do I, do I head south and go for that or do I take these other two options? options so it really started to kick off with just not even warm showers but people randomly just messaging me and wanting to host me and so it became a mix of that and out of 28 nights away so I ended up going all the way across the Netherlands down through um, Germany back across Switzerland twice and all the way through France the Mediterranean Sea I ended up being hosted for 28 nights 24 of them were with strangers and people from the warm showers hosting website oh do you know do you know what I just love so much is about is is one like how the experiments sort of change, but also how involved people get because they've all, they've got this like element of you, you know control and it's like they're part of your adventure. They're helping you with it, you know, not even in the in choosing the direction that you get to go, but also you know inviting you into their home, putting you up, feeding you cake. That obviously sounds amazing. <laughs> I mean, getting to stay with people you know, twenty four nights out of twenty eight or twenty eight nights out um, out of out of the days that you were away traveling. I mean, there must have been so many highlights from your adventure. You know, could you share just a few of the moments that really stand out for you? Yeah, I think one of them was um, the woman who wrote me a message about giving me bitter ball. And that was which are like these kind of meaty, it's almost like a scotch egg, but without the egg in the middle. And you have them with beer, basically. And um, she was an artist. And so I went there and she she took my picture and she took this really cool picture of me and she started painting me and just things like that were just random. And I got to connect with some friends that I hadn't seen for ages that had moved overseas. Um, yeah, there was a woman who she made good on her promise with the, the Black Forest Gatto. And, and then when I went down to my house, my bike and I looked in my helmet in the morning as I left her house in the Black Forest she'd given me um she knew that I was going to a town called Baden Baden where there's a spa and she'd bought me a day at the spa basically so I went there and just all these little things started happening and it did make me realize that there is you know there's more than one way to skin an adventure cat basically because even though I like to plan these people loved the fact that I hadn't contacted them months in advance and asked you know asked me to them to confirm a date in their diary they were just saying oh god we hate it when people get in touch so far ahead we love it when they just rock up or give us a day's notice and so it just made me realize yeah that people they do it in different ways no, absolutely. It's just amazing. So how did your adventure come to an end or finish it? I know obviously you had the, the time pressure on, like, were you, were you planning to cycle back? Or were you going to fly home? What was the plan? Yeah, no, I wanted to, I thought about cycling back, but I thought, well, that kind of, you know, it would be a bit stressful, maybe not knowing how I would get my route back. So I thought I will, I will fly back from wherever I end up, or I'll get a train. And that was one of the things about Europe. I actually thought, God, if I'm on my bike, that'd be great. You know, I can just maybe I'll end up somewhere in France, and I can just throw it on a on a train and get it back and um, I did I ended up in Marseille on the Mediterranean Sea and I kind of had about three days notice because the the the, the final vote was made and I had three days notice and so I started looking into ways to get home and I booked a train home and there was some big confusion where basically it turned out you can't take your bike on the Eurostar train from Marseille because the connection from there to Paris you have to have it in a box and I didn't have a box and then I was trying to ship it home with DHL it was a disaster so in the end I canned it I got a really hasty ride to an airport and um, threw my bike in a bike bag that I'd bought at some local bike shop and, I, and, um, and on a plane home Home. So it was a little bit stressful because I had to make it home for, um, it was one of Alistair Humphrey's Night of Adventure events actually, and I had to make it home for that. I couldn't just not turn up. Um, so, yeah. I was going to say, I can imagine you sort of like rushing at the door at the last moment, so oh, <laughs> just making gosh. it with minutes to spare. And the, the final host that I stayed with, they were so lovely, but they were the most chilled out people in the world. And I was sort of like, OK, do you think we could, you know, you said you'd give me a lift to the airport. Could we, do you think we could sort of leave now? And the, the, the guy, so, so French, he was like, oh, you've got so much time, Anna, don't worry. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to miss my flight. <laughs> you know, it's quite funny. Where did you come home to? So you, you said, you know, you, you left where you were staying in, in Brixton, you know, you left your house, yeah. you've left, left your job. What, what was happening? Did you have a plan? 
Well, um, I just, so uh, Mr. Jamie McDonald and I had got together six months earlier. So Jamie is the the love interest in my Pants of Perspective book, but he's a real life character too. Um, so we got together six months earlier and he lived in Gloucester. And so I made the decision to move out of London and move to Gloucester with him. So that's what, so, but we didn't know, we didn't have anywhere to live. He was actually living at home with his parents at the time, sleeping on a mattress behind their couch because they, they had like five foster kids in the house. So uh, um, we were sort of trying to work that out and he's not the most planned person on the planet uh, the other end of the spectrum to me so um yeah that's why I was coming home knowing that I would probably go to Gloucester but not really having anywhere so it was a sort of a few weeks at my parents before we finally got ourselves sorted out oh congratulations I was just say I, I loved reading the book and I loved the love story element uh, <laughs> it, it gave me hope I was like oh I could go on an adventure and still make somebody like, fabulous <laughs> do you know what though that's what the whole thing showed me is like I I you know I was just doing me Jamie was just doing him he was following his passion I'm following my passion and our paths just collided and I think that's when the most amazing relationships happen I mean, there was actually, I mean, there was actually a, a really key moment in the book which, which stood out for me, actually, was when Jamie said to you, like, you, you're not okay, and you don't have to put on a brave face about everything. You can, you know, like, be be upset or be tired or be whatever it was. And I, I felt that was like a real key turning point in in the book for you in terms of just sort of admitting that you weren't strong all the time, which I found like incredibly empowering to hear. Yeah, it really was. And it was painful to hear as well, because especially, you know, Jamie is one of these people, he he can see, he can see exactly what's going on. He's incredibly emotionally intelligent, and he could see what's going on. And he'd also been through it because he'd run across Canada himself. So he knew. And, and it was a really hard thing for me to take, because as I explained in the book, you know, I, I feel that my role sometimes in people's lives is, is to be that sunshine, is to bring that sort of like, it's okay, we got this. Um, but what I realized is that I was doing everyone a disservice because you, you can't help people if you pretend that everything's fine all the time because the reality it isn't. And then that means that when other people aren't fine, they think it's abnormal because all they see is everyone being fine. Um, yeah, it was a huge turning point in the journey for me. And so I, I always make a, a, an effort to be a bit more honest. And, and normally I find if I'm writing a blog post and I'm nervous and I'm hovering over the keys, then I probably need to press publish. <laughs> No, 100%. It's just incredibly powerful to be able to share, you know, the high points of your journey, but also, you know, the low points, the, the challenging points. I mean, yeah. it was great to, to follow your journey um, in the Andes, cycling the Andes, um, with Faye, who we've also spoken with on the Tough Girl podcast. Oh, yay. Good. She's awesome. She's absolute, absolute legend, 100%. So tell us, how did, you know, this next adventure come about, you know, deciding, A, what you were going to do, where you were going to do it, um, and also I suppose taking into account your new relationship as well like did you want to be a no not that you would want to be a part for six months but you know you you want to obviously continue your your passions and your hobbies but how did you get that balance between between everything yeah so I'll tackle the the actual adventure idea first and then I'll come back to the relationship part because I think the the relationship parts are really interesting ones so I am so I decided that I wanted to go somewhere different again so I'm always trying to find somewhere new for adventures and I mean that in the sense of something I think is going to test my comfort limits in a different way and I am really nervous speaking other languages which is ridiculous because I'm so gobby and confident in English and I think perhaps that's why I struggle in other languages because I, I, I feel like I'm trying to communicate and I love communicating but I can't and, and so I just get all tongue-tied and so I thought Anna enough of this English speaking country exploring malarkey like you need to go somewhere where you're out of your comfort zone the culture is very different and you can't speak the language and I'd been looking at South America for a while and I'd seen so many amazing pictures and I love mountains and so the Andes had always had a little sort of draw for me and and I thought well if I'm going to go to the Andes I want to be somewhere really beautiful and remote and if I'm going to do that and I can't speak the language the reality is I, I probably I knew from New Zealand that I didn't want to spend too much time by myself so I decided that I'd, I'd probably like to take someone else with me and the other side of that was I think it's it's great to do adventures on your own and I highly recommend it as a, a tool for getting to know yourself. But it's all it's actually quite easy in a way because you can completely lose your rag and it doesn't affect anyone else. <laughs> Whereas 
when you're in close confines with someone else, you just you have to you have to hone your patience and your tolerance and you have to have so much more understanding and self-awareness. And I thought, what a great way to test that than going on a big adventure with someone. Um, and it just so happens that I'd most recently met Faye and I, I knew that she wasn't particularly happy in her job. And so I called her up and said, yeah, basically, do you want to would you consider going on a six month adventure to South America with me? And she just got made redundant. She was like, yeah bring it on, let's go for it. <laughs> and um, and that was it. Yeah. Love it. And then in terms of like the, the relationship part as well, so that was like the adventure part. So the relationship part, you know, having this conversation, because I think you also missed your brother's wedding as well, didn't you? I did. Yeah, so I did. And that was, um, that was, I guess it, it's one of those things that uh, to, sometimes I feel embarrassed telling people, but I then have to remember that my, my family, we love each other very much and we understand one another. And so I'd arranged to go to South America. It was kind of in the diary, we were all set, flights booked. And then my brother proposed to his fiance, amazing, and said they were going to get married. And they said, uh, when, you think, when are you going on your adventure? Because we're thinking of getting married in December. And I was going from October to April. And I had this horrible moment where they were saying, oh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll move the wedding. We won't get married in December and whatever. And it was my mum. And I was going, oh, no, maybe I can fly back. And then I thought, I can't fly back. It just it changes the whole dynamic of the, the adventure if you come home halfway in between. And um, it wasn't about cost or anything. It was more about the, the sensation of being away from home. And and it was my mum who was sat there in the living room, both of us. She was like, oh, for goodness sake, will you two? John T, who's my brother, she's like, you just do what you want to do. You get married when you want to get married. Anna, you do what you want to do. You'll both be happy and that'll be great. And we were just like, yeah, do you know what? That's fine. So, um, yeah, it was great. So I made him a, um, him and his wife, Kate, I made them a love heart out of donkey poo on their wedding day and sent them a picture. Um, and my, my dad, oh, being my dad, Jamie, my boyfriend, went to the wedding on my behalf and my dad arranged for a life-sized picture of me to be at the wedding, a blown up, full cardboard cutout. And um, he chose, I would say, the most overweight image of me from the past 15 years of my life to be blown up to life size. Um, so thanks for that one, Dad. So, yeah. So I got loads of pictures of me like on the dance floor, people taking selfies with me. And um, yeah, it's hilarious. That is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. And what says love more than a heart shape made out of donkey poo? <laughs> exactly. I actually thought it was llama poo. And then someone on Twitter corrected me. They were like, I think you'll find that's donkey poo. And I was like, you're so right, actually. Llama poo is smaller. Yeah, who knew? Um, um, yeah um and on the so on the relationship side so I think when when Jamie and I who's also an adventurer when we got together I think we both knew that we were always going to be going off and and doing stuff and we would have to learn how to cope with what is not only time apart but actually two incredibly independent people we are so independent and so fine by ourselves that you know sometimes it's difficult to actually make sure we sort of steer our train tracks in a similar direction um but originally it was kind of planned well, I always knew I'd be going on next adventure and so did Jamie and originally it was planned that he would be on his next adventure while I was on mine and then while I was away he had a visa problem and he couldn't leave and so it ended up accidentally him being at home for six months while I was away and it was one of those things that I was so worried about I thought you know are you an idiot Anna you've just met the love of your life and you're taking off because your adventure itch is so big and you have to scratch it and you might lose this boy and and actually it was fine it was so romantic it was like we had 140 characters from my my satellite my gps device i was sending him each night you know he'd kind of get a bite-sized rundown of the day which was you know uh, climbed a climbed a mountain pass uh, got rained on wind terrible ate sausages for tea love you <laughs> and um, and that's how we maintained our relationship and then he did fly out after three months and we spent a couple of weeks together in Chile and then, um, but yeah, but he's now just gone for what is a year and a half away. So I'm just entering into it again. Um, but yeah, I think if it's the right person, you can make it through anything. Absolutely. I love that. So how did you, I mean, South America, it's an incredible continent, but it is a big continent. There's just so many countries. There's so many mountains. How did you decide what route you were going to cycle, where you were going to do? Was that sort of a joint thing between you and Faye or had you already sort of planned it b before you sort of um, got Faye involved? No, it's definitely a joint thing. And I was really conscious because I'd done some big adventures before and this was to be Faye's sort of biggest one. I mean, she'd done Kilimanjaro and she'd cycled the length of New Zealand, but this was to be her biggest trip away. I was really conscious. And I said this to her really early on. I don't want this to be 
oh, my trip and Faye's coming along. I really wanted it to be our trip, you know, our journey together. And that meant that all the decisions we made were together right from the start. So we, we were originally going to go on, on kick scooters. Um, we found out that they don't go up hills. So we, we couldn't go on kick scooters, but we went and tested them out together. And, and then we made that decision about, we even questioned after the scooter idea failed, do, do we want to go to South America? Do we want to still st- stick on sto- scooters and go somewhere else? But the route came about because after the scooter fiasco, we we realised that we both really loved going up mountains, up hills. We both have this sick love of cycling up hills and the pain that it brings us. And she knew that she liked altitude from Kilimanjaro and I'd never really been up at altitude. And so it was definitely said that if we're going to South America, we're going to follow the spine of the Andes quite closely. And that uh, what, you know, we decided, well, if we both love mountains and we love going up mountains, then let's not rush. You know, let's go up as many peaks and passes of the Andes as we possibly can in the six months that we've got. So that's what we did. We started in La Paz in Bolivia and we made our way down to Ushuaia, which is the very southern tip of Argentina. And we went up round about, yeah, 100,000 metres of ascent. I think we did 103,000 metres of ascent on our bikes by the end. I mean, it's an incredible, especially <laughs> when you look on a map as well and, and see like the distance that you travelled. So you spent 184 days pedalling 5,500 miles. And then I think you've also worked it out that, you know, ascending over 100,000 metres is equivalent to 11 times the height of Everest on bicycles. I mean, <laughs> it's it's phenomenal. It's a bit silly, isn't it? Silly but fun, which we love. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about Bolivia, La Paz, you know, highest city in the whole world. You've obviously got Death Road in there. You've got the Salt Flats, um, you know, incredible, yeah. incredible place to start. What was it like flying into into the city? You know, did you find you liked altitude? Because you must have been hit with it almost straight away. Oh, my days. I couldn't, we couldn't even, get, we, we were laughing because we could not get our bike boxes off the conveyor belt. I mean, La Paz Airport, for being a, a huge city airport, is a tiny place. And we had to get our bike boxes off onto the ground and drag them out into the arrivals hall. And honestly, we were doing it one step at a time. It was so funny. We were just so breathless. And it probably took us two or three days before we even got over that vague breathlessness. But the thing that struck me was actually how we were in La Paz for um, 10 days by the time we left fully in the end. But I was just struck by how little I ate. My, I mean, I've got an appetite like a horse and I'd buy a burrito in the morning and it, it was an achievement if I'd managed to I'd quarter it. It was an achievement if I'd managed to eat the third quarter by like five o'clock in the evening. You know, it was just ridiculous. Um, yeah, so we spent uh, 10 days in La Paz taking, we took three days of Spanish lessons because we had no Spanish whatsoever, which was hilarious. And um, and then we did a few little test rides. And I have to say on those test rides, at one point we 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 tried to go up to around about, so La Paz is 4,000 metres. We tried to go up to um, almost 5,000 metres on bikes and we made it to 4.3. And I just, my body said, no, you know, I just started getting a bit delirious and stuff. So we turned around. But over the, the next few weeks, we really did start to acclimatise. But I love La Paz. It's mental. It's completely bonkers. There's no other way to describe it. And there's hot, there's hardly any chain stores. And it's just independent, just independent everywhere. And, and people just selling stuff on the streets and noise and chatter and traffic and people dressed as zebras helping you cross the road. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> love it so did you because I um when I was over in Bolivia I cycled down death road and found yes. it absolutely uh one of the scariest things that I've ever done but I was doing that as part of like a tour package there was about 12 of us going down in our in our black and red I think it was with a company called gravity and, oh yes yeah, yeah I know them yeah and um it was it was quite an exciting experience bearing in mind that I hadn't actually been on a bicycle since I was probably about 13 but <laughs> um you know you have you have a lot of tourists out there doing that for for fun um and you're out there like bike packing um yeah uh, well, how was do, do you remember that road was it wasn't oh the first my god road it was cycle. hilarious yeah because pete the tourists thought we were mental and and they just thought we were bonkers but what was funny is that to get to that road we did a, a big loop through um the Yungus, which is that area where it's in very jungly very dense kind of looks like really amazonian and um, very humid not what you would necessarily imagine Bolivia to look like at all. But um, 
we we I think before we made it to that road, we'd gone f- along a few dodgy roads before then. I think the thing we realised about the Death Road is that it's called the Death Road because it, it's got some fantastic views and amazing drops. But actually, it is it is now maintained better, and the car you know cars don't go it except the tourist vehicles. They don't go along it anymore, so it's actually relatively safe compared to other areas of Bolivia. Where if you're going by yourself, you'll come across a road that's crumbled away completely, and you know there's no there's no tourist office there telling you that it's safe. So um, the Death Death Row was okay by the time we got there, but I still stuck to the wall. I mean, Faye was going closer to the edge and I was thinking, I can't, I can't fight this feeling that there's a 2000 meter drop there and there's nothing, nothing to stop me going over it. Um, but yeah, the tourists were, were hilarious. Like, cause you know, like people would come down packs of them on their mountain bikes and they were, they were having a whale of a time. And then they'd stop at us and they'd say, you on your own bikes with, you know, all our gear on it. And we'd say, yeah. And they were like, you can do this. I was like, yeah, yeah, you can do this. Um, and they seemed to, they just seemed to find it just crazy that we had just come here on our own bikes and not on a tour. Um, we looked completely out of place and ridiculous and our, and our bags were bouncing around. Whereas you know, we were a bit jealous really, to be honest, they looked like more fun without the bags on. Oh no, it's still an amazing experience. How are you navigating? Um, I, we, we actually discovered, um, um, a really good, iphone app called map out which is it's like a fiver to to download and then you doubt da- and then downloading the tiles after that is free and what i love about it is it's so easy and you 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 can trace you can trace your routes you can plan your routes and you can look at elevation as well and you can send routes to your friend and whatever so we found that that map out was actually a really really good tool for navigation because before that i was looking at there were there were there are there are so many um, GPS app tools out there for your mobile phone, and I did have a backup Garmin um, and Etrex, but I sent that home in the end because with two of us we always had a backup. So um, yeah, we're just using a GPS app on our phones. And, and what about sort of accommodation and stuff like that? I mean, where we was it wild camping? Was it B and B's, used hostels? Yeah. What did you do? wild camping all the way basically um we might when we got further south into chile and argentina every now and then we probably treat ourselves once a week once every 10 days to a night in a hostel um just to charge up phones and everything and actually have a shower (laughs) um but in bolivia oh man it is there is just so much space and wild areas and just no one cares you can just you know you won't have seen anyone for two days so you just put off to the side of the road and 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 even if someone does come along like a man came over for breakfast one morning with his llama he just we just peered from the hills and just came over and chatted to us in spanish and brought his llama with him and then wandered off and um and wild camping in south america is just amazing like it's just it's so different to to uh, certainly usa and and even new zealand and the uk like there's just so much more freedom there to pitch up wherever you like oh love it what was i mean there must have been challenges sort of left right and center you, you've already sort of mentioned about the language language barriers but you've had you know a couple of days of lessons on that which is amazing you've got your navigation sorted out with map out what were the other challenges that you, that you faced on this journey Um, in, I mean, in Bolivia, it was quite, we got um, nutrition was a real struggle because they, they don't seem to have the best diet there. They really love bread and, and sugar and, um, which is great at first because you're burning loads of calories and you're at altitude and you, you know, you're not really putting on weight. But it would get start to get frustrating when we come into a small town and really the only thing they had for you to stock up on, you know, we'd, we'd have to buy some water because there wasn't any taps there that we could drink from. So we'd have to buy bottles of water. And then the only other thing we could buy would be wafers or dry crackers or um, packets of cookies. And by the time we left Bolivia, I was just thinking, I'm going to end up diabetic. Like, this is terrible. I'm so sick of eating sugar. You know, that. and um, only as we got further south and things got a little bit more populated, did we then start to go, OK, we can have raisins and nuts now. And um, so we were caught in Bolivia. We really struggled with the nutritional side of things. And also we did this we did this really remote loop. Um, we were trying to go up this volcano called Vulcan Uturunku, which is goes up to about 6000 metres high. And we didn't make it all the way to the top in the end. We made it to about 5,800 metres before it was getting too dark and we both completely topped out on what our bodies were coping with. But um, on that loop, every time we'd get into a town, which would be three to five days between towns, we'd only have had one day spare food with us. And we'd get there and the 
the only shop in the town would be shut because everyone was at a football game two two towns over and we're thinking oh my goodness me you know so um i think if we'd done it again we probably would have carried more food because sometimes we were down to around about 800 calories a day which is ridiculous absolutely ridiculous altitude um and and yeah so that made it really tough and and by the end of that really remote loop everything just started to break down you know you get cracks and cuts and things and um I was ready for a pizza and a beer at the end of that oh god I'm not surprised 100 percent definitely a pizza yeah. and a beer um I heard there was some naked cycling tell us more about that yes. <laughs> well so Faye um a part of this journey Faye you know when you have a friend you, you really want to see them kind of blossom and I I knew that there were certain things that Faye was nervous about on this journey. One of the fears she had was she was worried that she wouldn't keep up with me, and uh, which was ridiculous because she just destroyed me on loads of it. And we just, you know, it, as the days went on, some days she'd have a good day, some days I'd have a good day. And so I think that fear leveled out. But one of the other things is <laughs> Faye, Faye hates getting naked. She She's like really nervous and a bit self-conscious. And so I thought I had a little plan that I was going to try and get her naked more often. And... Um, and one of the places was I'd seen pictures of people cycling naked on the salt flats. And the thing about the salt flats is other than it being the most serene, incredible place to ride your bike because you can't see anyone or anything and it's perfectly flat and still and there's blue sky and white salt and just the crunch of your wheels going over the little hexagons of salt. Other than that, it's a great place to get naked because you can see anyone coming for about half an hour. Um, so you've got plenty of time to get your clothes back on. And so I told Faye, I said, before we go to the salt flats, you know, we're going to get naked, don't you? And she was like, yeah, right, whatever. And I said, no, seriously, this is part of your, your learning, your training. We're doing this. And, um, and on day two in the salt flats, I pulled over and stopped my bike. She was like, what are you doing? I was like, now, Faye, it's happening now. I just started stripping off. And um, she was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, come on, come on. And um, it was just amazing. Yeah, so we both got butt naked, then got on our bikes. And at first, Faye's, like, covering everything up. And I'm going, Faye, I've seen it all before. You know, I got bits too. It's fine. And um, and then we set off. And then, oh, just being naked. Have you ever cycled naked, Sarah? I've never cycled naked, no. Right. It, it, right, screw, like, visiting countries. Like, it needs to go on a bucket list because <laughs> – the sensation of being on your bike with like this warm breeze passing you and the heat on every single part of your body, even the heat from the saddle on your bum, it's just so liberating. And so after a few minutes of kind of awkward cycling, we're then doing like naked flyby high fives and like, and then next time we go past, I'm like slapping a boob. And um, <laughs> it was, we had so much fun in the end and we kind of didn't want to put our clothes back on, but we, we had to um but yeah so that was but but for for Faye she just said she was like that was something that I was so terrified about and funnily enough it wasn't scary at all and actually it was amazing which is my experience of everything in adventures facing your fears absolutely facing your fears, getting naked so it I mean one of the one of the posts that I remember that you that you shared on Facebook which actually sort of really quite scared me I have to say was when you got bitten by a dog um tell us a little bit more about that and like what what happened well, yeah, and it's kind of unfortunate, really, because you hear about things like that. And I almost didn't want to share it because I thought I'd never want to do anything to reinforce the fears that people have about travel. But um, I'm generally a cat person anyway. I mean, I absolutely love dogs, but generally a team cat. And we were waiting for a package to turn up in um, Punta Arenas, which is down at the start of the Carretera Ostrao in, in Chile near Patagonia and uh, we've been waiting up and we we were just going to go out for one more little ride on our bikes without our bags on just as a little sort of stretch of the legs and we we were halfway through the ride we just turned around and we were quite used to being chased by dogs I mean they're just you know there's just lots of wild dogs in South America and we got used to what to do to to get rid of them and and we had a couple of different tactics and one of them was to stop still on your bike and to scream at them and they would normally retreat you know don't show them any fear and just scream at them until they retreat and so this dog ran out of the house and started going mental at me and Faye had already gone through and I, I stopped my bike and I was screaming at it and it stopped and was backing off and then out of nowhere this other dog flew around the side of the house just ran straight up to my right leg clamped its jaws around the front of it, it just bit down on it and it happened so quickly and it felt like my shin had gone into a vice. I've never been in that much pain. And I was just in shock. And then this dog was gone. I was just like limping off and Faye was looking back at me being like, what just happened? Um, and I was just so angry at whoever's dog that was. I thought, how can you not control your dog? You know, how can you let it go and bite someone? 
And anyway, so it was pretty painful when it had kind of sunk in in three places out of its four canines, three of them had gone through. And at first I thought, oh, great, it hasn't broken the skin. And then it quickly became apparent that it had. And uh, my biggest thing was just rabies. <laughs> um, and I, for some reason, I've been reading a book about rabies. I don't know why someone had it on the train and I thought it looked like a cool book. So I bought it. Um, and it's, a, it's quite a frightening disease. Anyway, it just ended up being a bit of a hassle because I had to go to two different hospitals to convince them that I needed some follow up rabies jabs. I'd had my pre my pre jabs, but all the pre jabs do is they they slow the spread of it. I mean, the likelihood of that dog having rabies was tiny, but still, I wanted to be really super cautious. So um, yeah, it was just a pain, and then I had to have follow up jabs a month later while I was still in Chile. So. Um, yeah, it just turned out to be a hassle in the end. And it did leave me a bit frightened of dogs for the rest of the trip. But I was very, very conscious that I wasn't going to let it make me have a fear of dogs because I thought you just got to get back on the horse. Um, so I'm still a bit nervous, but I'm, I'm sort of getting over it. Yeah, oh no, 100%, 100%. So you're cycling through all these incredible areas, like the photos on your Instagram account are just absolutely stunning. What was it like? How did it work out tra- traveling with another person? I mean, th- you must have had, um, you know, disagreements. If it's just the two of you, how did you decide, you know, what you were going to do? You know, yeah, how did that, how did that work out? Or did you, yeah, put, I, sorry, you go on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, did you put like rules and regulations in, sort of say, you know, if, if I feel really, really uncomfortable, I don't want a wild camp here, we're just going to continue on, or we could veto ideas, just like, oh. yeah, how you worked it. Yeah, I know some people, they kind of have a discussion and they set rules before they start. And I think that's a good way to go sometimes. But for Faye and I, I think we both, we are the reason I chose Faye to, to call and ask to come on adventure is because I know she's got an absolute heart of gold. And I sort of thought if you've got two people together that really their only intention is to do good and not to hurt another person, then surely you're going to be able to make it through. And so it just so happened that we the, we de- the first few weeks was definitely us getting used to one another and you just realize how many quirks and habits someone else has and then you think goodness me I must have quirks and habits as well and so we'd have little disagreements but nothing too bad there was I think on both sides there were probably a lot of you know just managing it not not saying anything or whatever because really it doesn't matter um and uh, and then as the trip wore on, I think we just got more and more honest with one another. And that's something that I learned through my relationship with Jamie, actually. He's a very, very honest person. And if there's a problem, he will bring it up straight away, no matter how you know ugly it seems at the time. And so I started to do that with Faye. And Faye was really uncomfortable at the start. But then she got better at it. And it even started when we went tried to go up that volcano at Vulcan at Turunku. And at 4,700 metres, there were just some comments back and forth about um, we were both basically, it was a very high stress situation situation we were both nervous about making it and there was a comment and it had been misunderstood and then I'd said something else and and Faye went really quiet and so we got to 4,700 meters and honestly I just pulled my gloves off threw them on the floor and I was like Faye you upset she was like yes I am and I was like let's talk about it then so we sat there uh, like halfway up a mountain and had this emotional discussion and hugged and it was just I think from that point on we just learned you've just got to get clear it out and then we climbed into our tent that evening and Faye calls over. She's like, mate, I'm sorry for being a douche today. And I was like, no, I'm sorry for being a douche today. Love you. Night. <laughs> um, and so from that point on, even when it felt uncomfortable, because if you do it once, you, you think it's going to be fine the next time. You just got to keep bringing stuff up. Um, and there was one occasion where I held something in for about 10 days, which was just to do with um, Faye's phase, as she says on her Twitter profile. She's very good at losing stuff. And um And there were a couple of occasions where she'd forgotten things, which actually turned out to be quite funny. But in the end, there was a moment where I felt like we weren't being um, working as a team. And I chose not to say something. And then to the point where it kind of boiled up inside of me and I had to say it. And it came out on Christmas Eve and on a day when her dog was really sick. And I just felt horrendous. But I had to say it because I just thought at the end of the day, I'm not respecting our friendship. If I feel like I can sweep these things under a rug because I don't have to deal with them in a couple of months time, that's not respecting the fact that Faye and I are going to be in one another's lives, you know, until our dying days, hopefully. And so I just decided to bring it up. And um, oh, it was a beautiful moment because I, I spoke to Jamie after Faye had, um, she was gone to collect her tracker that she'd forgotten. And <laughs> Jamie in his Gloucester accent, he just said to me, he's like, oh my God, Anna, he's like, here it is. You're out there. It's Christmas Eve. You're learning. You're growing as a person. And I'm sat here in my pants eating quality streets. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just thought, that's it, isn't it? You never know what you're going to get on adventures. You're always learning and growing. And um, I learned so much from being with Faye, and she's got a heart of gold, so we were fine in the end. I, th- you know, I think that's such a powerful lesson, not just for, for when you're adventuring, but just for life in general. I mean, I think for me particularly, I was just sort of like, want to keep the peace. I, d- I don't like confrontation. Oh, I don't like me. argument. I'm probably very passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It all comes out. You can't. That's the thing I think both of us realize. You end up just getting passive aggressive. Like, how are you? Fine. You're not fine. Why are those words even leaving your mouth? You know? Um, yeah. No, it's it's hard and it needs training. It's like a muscle. And I think uh, I think it, it's easier to have the conversation when you know that whatever is being said, it's coming from a place of love and a, and a, a, a want to sort it out, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's a long time to, to be away from home, from, from, from your boyfriend, from your family. You know, when you're coming to, towards the end of your journey, were you, were you ready for it to come to an end? Or were you like, oh, my God, this is, this is gutting. I want to turn around and go up the East Coast or something. You know? Oh, it's, yeah, as I'm sure everyone says, it's both of those things. We were so ready to be done. I think, I think because um, Patagonia was actually, in many ways, a challenge because it was near. We'd been on the road for five months by the time we got down there, and it was windy and rainy and um, beautiful as well. But equally, we were we were going up mountains that were 800 meters high, and we'd been spending two days going up, you know, five and a half thousand, six thousand meter passes, and so the the challenge of can I do this today had sort of run out by that time and so that that challenge was gone and then really all that remained was a sort of a homesickness and a oh actually I think we'd quite like to be done so we were we were sort of just clinging on for the last the last month I'd say together still trying to enjoy it but there is that that collision because you know the second you finish and even now I I say to Faye I'm like Faye do you think we appreciated it enough while we were there because I look back on pictures and oh it's just amazing the landscapes and um but I think we did I think we appreciated it as much as possible but it is a kind of double-edged sword when you come towards the end of it because adventures are simple you know life is simple out there your your daily goals are concrete and um you come home to a, a load of obligations and being pulled in different directions so it's quite difficult yeah I mean and it's it is like it's a it's a wonderful it's a tough lifestyle but it, you know it is actually wonderful to 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 be out somewhere where you absolutely love and and I, I really like what you just said you know appreciate did we appreciate it you know while we were out there enough I mean it must have been that sense of satisfaction of seeing the 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 Ushuaia sign at the very southernmost point of South America it must have been incredible how did you guys go and celebrate yeah <laughs> Well, what's funny is that this shows this shows our priorities. We got into Ushuaia, and we were like, it was really cold. Like it was, it just hit winter, um, and it was starting to snow, and it was we couldn't feel our toes. And we got into Ushuaia, and we were hit this crossroads, and we said, Faith, should we go and pose by the Ushuaia sign and kind of do it now, or should we go and have a burger? We like to go and have a burger, <laughs> so we went and sat for like two hours, burger, coffee. So I guess that was our celebration. But in a way, I also think it was a way of prolonging the end. I think I think we didn't we didn't want to go to that sign and have it finished. We just wanted a little bit more time for us to kind of process and sit down and think about it. And then we were we sort of finished our burgers and said, "Should we go and should we go and finish this?" Then we were like, "Yeah, go on then." Oh. Um, but yeah, burger celebrations. Amazing, massive congratulations! An incredible <laughs> achievement. I mean, people definitely have to go and check out your website, annamcnuff.com, to go and see like more about the the journey and just how far you've gone and all these squiggles with the red line just from all the different mountain passes you've done I mean previously we've talked about what you know when you came back for, from New Zealand you know suffering from the adventure blues what was was that the same for you or had you already got your Canada trip planned no that was heavy it was it was heavy it wasn't as bad as New Zealand but I did um, it did prompt me to write a really long blog post which was the first post I've actually written fully about post-adventure blues and and fully from the point of view of trying to help anyone else that was going through it and I spoke to a load of different adventurers like Sarah Alton um, Laura Penhall Al Humphreys Dave Cornthwaite and I collated some of their thoughts on what they were saying um, because it definitely still hit me. Came back from the Andes. I knew it was coming. And I think it was probably two weeks after I, 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 this time I tried a new tactic of coming home and then going away again, straight away. And so I went to the French Alps for a week and 
I found that was really helpful because I came back, saw friends and family, got a little bit back into the swing of life. And then I could go back to an environment where everything was quite simple. And I, I had a kind of bit more clarity and, and distance from my life to reflect. Um, but it hit me and it, it was at this time it was weird. It's different every time from New Zealand. It would last. It lasted for about three months and was really quite bad. This time it would be even more acute but it would only last a day or two and and I'd feel horrendous for two days you know completely hopeless lost wondering what on earth I'm doing in my life and then two days later it would pass and then it'd come back again and um but I think yeah it's just different every time but um writing that blog post definitely helped and being more ready for it and and not trying to ignore the thoughts or shove them aside but sort of almost sit them down and talk to them like they're your friends I think that helped yeah. Oh, no, thank you for doing that. I think that's so powerful because it is, you know, mental health is something we just need to talk to talk more about. So um, I know we've only got sort of a, a couple of minutes left, but just a few more questions. I'd love to, if you've still got the time, just talk yeah. about, you know, like, oh, brilliant. Okay, fab. We'll carry on. Um, yeah. So Canada with Jamie in a van. How, how did that come up? <laughs> oh, well, that was uh, through all the timings of him him planning his next adventure. And, and he's doing a big run through America. He's going to spend a year running across America. And there was talk once upon a time of doing a, a book tour because he ran across Canada and he wrote a book about it. And there was talk of going and doing a book tour. And also for me to meet all of these characters in the book that he'd love to introduce me to. And it just so happened that when, when I come back from the Andes, that everything was going to sort of fall into place. And actually it worked out that he hadn't got his visa for America in time. And um, because it meant that we could then go and do this book tour. Um, it is the first adventure we've done together. And uh, it was it was really funny in the lead up to it because I'm a planner and he's not. I had to sit on my hands and I said to him, Jay, if we don't have a vehicle or, you know, a plan six weeks before we go, I'm going to I'm going to have to come off my hands and they're going to have to make a spreadsheet. And um, sure enough, six weeks to go. We did just about have a vehicle uh, which had been kindly donated by one of the Canadians out there. They bought us a van, which was ridiculous. Um, and then and I said, do you want me to plan this? He was like, yes, please. Um, and so I made this spreadsheet called Planada um, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite proud of that Love and in, in creating Planada I realized I was like Jay you know this thing we thought was going to take two and a half months well uh, because you stopped every 26 miles when you were running and we have to stop every 26 miles again it's probably going to take four months so it turned out that I couldn't go the whole way across with him um, but oh, it was great it was just it's kind of like I say to people, it, it was an adventure, but because I'm so used to doing things like physically, like on a bike or running, it wasn't an adventure in that sense. It was just more of a, a, a more adventurous way of leading what is kind of a home lifestyle. So our home just became our van. And um, and I was I've been writing a book. And so I was still kind of working and doing my my adventure job while I was out there. But I was just moving house every day and sitting in coffee shops in Canada instead of coffee shops in Gloucester. So, um, yeah, and I dragged him off to every available national park, not as many as I'd liked, but I loved it. Absolutely loved it. What was it? What was van life like? I mean, because that's very close quarters to be living with your with your other half for, for that length of time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think we it was it was fine, actually. And, and to be fair, we didn't spend that many nights in the van because we kept getting hosted so much. Um, and then it got down to sort of minus 30. Um, so it, people were hosting us even more. Uh, but it was quite nice. We had our own little routines. And oh, and I even put my back out at one point. So um, I had a disc bulge in my lower back, which meant I was laid out for three weeks across the back of the van. So he had to drive. And we had this giant stuffed moose called Monty that we put in the front, strapped him in the seatbelt in the passengers so he could navigate. Um, but yeah, I think it, we, we did well, actually. And But again, we learned so much about one another as a relationship on that journey, because when you're with someone, someone 24 hours a day you have to communicate so I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be feeling a bit ratty for some reason and I'd have to stop recognize that and then turn to Jamie and say Jay I'm a bit ratty today I just want you to know it's nothing to do with you I don't know why I'm just in a really bad mood and he'd be like okay thanks <laughs> um you know so um yeah but I, I I didn't think I'd like the cold of Canada but I absolutely loved it absolutely loved the cold oh amazing who knows a future arctic adventure could be uh, could be in the planning definitely I would do that in a heartbeat now I wasn't so sure before but now I just it makes you feel alive makes you feel so alive how is how's your book writing coming along when's the when's the next installment going to be coming out 
Do you know, that is what I've been doing. I've spent the weekend in the office in Gloucester um, with, uh, I am just about at the end of finishing the first draft. Um, so it's not long off going to, uh, for the first edit to my beautiful editor, Debbie. Um, so hopefully it'll come out late summer, I reckon. So it's, it's a lot, a lot of work still to be done, but the draft is done. And um, yeah, it's, it's yeah the, about the 50 state cycle. So it's kind of like a prequel, but it's high time it got written. Amazing. And do you have a title for it? Um, I do, but I don't think I want to, oh, I don't want to say it yet. <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely fine. I have to say I'm really chuffed with myself. I'm just kind of hoping no one steals it before I get there. I keep Googling it thinking, please don't steal my title for my book. It's, <laughs> Um, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Amazing. Now, there's actually been some really exciting news um, for you and for the Girl Guides because you are now their new um, ambassador. Um, Yay! I am. And we went to the Girl Guiding the Queen's Awards together, didn't we? We did. I've got these pictures still. They make me laugh, us taking like selfies in the in the House of Commons. I think the bit that I remember was when they were taking all these photos and for some reason, I don't know if it was you or me, we thought, well, we don't want to get in the way of the photo, so let's just crawl on the <laughs> floor. <laughs> To get away from the photo. And they were like, girls, you're the guest of honours. We kind of want you in. And we were just there on our all fours being like, oh, we're supposed to be in it. Yeah. But that, that's absolutely fantastic because I think it's so, I mean, you know, one of the things with Tough Girl Podcast, it's all about increasing that female role models. And to do that for the, for the guides is amazing. So tell us a little bit more about your role, what you're going to be doing. Yeah, I think it's just in trying to support them and to spread their message. And, you know, I was a brownie, a rainbow brownie guide and all of that. Um, I think girl guiding definitely went through a, a phase of being a little bit uncool, especially next to the scouts. I mean, you know, the scouts got bare grills and everything and the poor girl guides, you know. But but actually what they've been doing in the last few years behind the scenes, if they have been re you know rejuvenating the organization and they are it's got a huge strand of adventure in there so they're encouraging girls to be more adventurous but they're also doing a lot to teach the girls how to how to campaign for things that they're passionate about so it it doesn't matter if you're not an adventurer and if you're not into sport but what is it that you're passionate about and they will actually teach the girls how to um give presentations on it and do all that kind of stuff so really it's just an organization that is about letting the girls be the best version of themselves. And I am so like for that. So I'm just delighted. Um, so the role of being an ambassador, it just involves me going to some events, trying to be as connected as possible, visiting the girls when I can um, and supporting them in the press and the media. Um, basically just showing my support for what is a fab organization, getting girls inspired and outdoors. Oh, love it, which is amazing. And it's not only girls that you're inspiring, because you do inspire women as well. And I love like one of your passion projects, which is the Adventure Queens. Um, and I'd love everybody, all the tough girls to go and check out the Adventure Queens. <laughs> it's like totally awesome. But just share a little bit more um, about that and, and you know, what you've been doing in that area. Oh, that has just exploded, Sarah. Like It's probably like your uh, your tough girl challenges. You know, we just start something and and I mean, it began when I put out a call in the summer. I, I started some Adventure Queens interviews about um, two or three years ago with girls that had done big challenges. So the name came from that. But then last summer, I put out a call and I had this suspicion that more women wanted to get out while camping, but they just didn't know quite what to do or where to start. And so I, I put this message out on Facebook and Twitter that said, I'm thinking of starting you know, a tips and advice thing for, for girls who'd like to get wild camping but aren't quite sure where to start. If you're interested, sign up here. And I had 600 women sign up in five days. And I sat back and went, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, like, I think... I think I need to do something with this. So I picked up the phone to my friend Emma, who is a marketing whiz, and we've known each other for years. And she's really, um, in, she's inspired and she loves adventures. And and she and I said, Emma, will you help me run Adventure Queens? And she, that was it. She came on board, and then the community, I guess, was founded then. And yeah, it's just gone bananas. We've got like over two and a half thousand people on the Facebook group now. Um, and there's basically a monthly tips and advice emails and we're moving to we encourage everyone to get out on their local hilltops and help them do that just of, of their own. And we've got 18 local groups with little chief chief uh, adventure queens who volunteer to just steer them in sort of where the best places to go are and offer advice. Um, and then, yeah, we're starting to organise quarterly camp outs as well so it's just it's just exploding and the whole theme of it is it's 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 women leading women you know it's ems and i are steering it but really if you look at the facebook group everyone someone asks a piece of advice and everyone just chips in it's so supportive and i think what what i saw from the first big camp out we had together which was last weekend is that you know people are so nervous that they don't know how to put their tent up and whatever and 
who cares? Like no one cares. You know, it's fantastic. You don't know how to put your tent up because you're going to learn and then you're going to show someone else and you're going to learn how to build a fire. And um, yeah, it's just about a safe environment where girls can feel like women that they can go and do something they've always wanted to do. And there's no fear of judgment. Yeah. And it, and it, Love it. it creates this like massive ripple effect because, you know, those those 18 local groups, you know, they're going to encourage all that. The other the other women's friends and family will see it happening. And think, oh, I can get involved in that. Suddenly the groups are going to grow. They're going to get bigger. It's just going to it's just going to exactly. spread out, which is amazing. And, and, and as I was saying to you earlier, before we started recording, like so many of them listen to the Tough Girl podcast. Like I think actually all of them at some point, if they've come into the group, they end up listening to your podcast. So which is amazing because that's great that when they're not I think the important thing is they get inspired when they're all together but if they're not physically together it's about having other things that reinforce this is the normal you know you can do this stuff and your podcast helps and do that so that's blooming brilliant yeah I love it we're changing the world Anna it's amazing yeah, we are I'm like I'm like fist bumping you through the yeah boom so Anna what a, writing the book amazing you've got Jamie yeah. running across um well soon to be the USA Yes. What about you? What's going to be the next challenge? Have you got anything planned? Is stuff you're thinking about or or can you not share with us yet? Um, I do. I hate being one of those people that can't share, but I do have um, I do have a, uh, a running adventure in mind for 2019, uh, which is going to require a lot of planning and um, logistical things. So I'm working on that. And I'm just about to start focusing on that. So it's a good year and a half away, but um, I'm going to start focusing on that. Um, and then in between, it's about yeah, getting this next book out, building Adventure Queens, and then nipping backwards and forwards to America to visit Jamie and run with him. Um, and also just do some mini adventures around the UK, I think. So building up to a next big one, but in the meantime, taking some time to do other things that I love. Oh, it sounds amazing. And so, Anna, just any final, actually, no, sorry. Anna, where is the best place that people can find out more information about you, find out more about the Adventure Queens? Where should they go? Yeah, if you go to just AnnaMcNuff.com, that's all about me. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Anna McNuff. And um, for Adventure Queens, there's adventurequeens.co.uk. Um, and there's also a Facebook group. So if you search for that, um, yeah, those are the ways you can find out more. Absolutely. Love it. I will be making sure I include all of the links um, to the websites you mentioned, to all your social media and to your awesome book, The Pants of Perspective, which I can highly recommend. It was actually the first book in the Tough Girl a Tribe book club, which was oh, amazing. So, I've heard that. I'm honoured. Yeah. it's an amazing book so we, we all love it which is fabulous yeah, thanks so much but Anna, any final words of advice final words of wisdom anything that you've learned over the past year which has really struck a chord with you and think and that would add value to to our listeners I think you know there's that expression like dance like no one's watching um I I'm just extending that to life I think you should live your life like no one's watching and I don't mean that in a selfish way I just mean stop you know stop worrying about what everyone else thinks of you and actually sit down listen to yourself listen to what it is that you do that makes you happy and do that because that that will lead to wonderful things so live like nobody's watching and get naked and get on a bike. And get naked! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anna, that was brilliant. Oh, she's like, uh, Anna, as I say, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share your story. I really appreciate it. Oh, total pleasure. Anytime. Hey tribe i hope you enjoyed that awesome episode with anna mcnuff what a total legend if you haven't listened to the first episode i did with anna then please do go back and take a listen anna shares more about her backstory her life growing up with both parents who are olympians um tons of great information and she also shares more about how she got into the adventuring world her big cycle across america when she cycled throughout the full 50 states as well as running the full length of new zealand loads of information really, really inspiring, well worth a listen. Equally, I'd also recommend you go and get the book Pants of Perspective, Anna's book. Again, a great story, a great read, and it's nice to be able to support other women out there who are doing these incredible adventures and sharing with them with us on social media. It is all about motivating and inspiring the next generation and also motivating and inspiring you to go out and take a step outside of your comfort zone. 
I'd also recommend lots of recommendations today, but I spoke with Faye Shepherd, Anna's cycling buddy for the Andes. That was last Tuesday. So go and take a listen to Faye as well, because then you sort of get both sides of the coin and you get to hear about the same adventure from a different perspective and it sort of completes the circle. So it's great to be able to have both Faye and Anna on the Tough Girl podcast. Normally, the Tough Girl podcast comes out every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. I do like doing Tough Girl Extra, which is when we go back and speak with previous guests who've been on the Tough Girl podcast. We speak to members of the Tough Girl tribe. It's something I do want to increase. Um, I'd love to get more episodes out there. I want to obviously increase the amount of stories and and share them wide and far however it does it's the time it takes to do it and um and the, and the costs involved and the reason that this episode was was able to come out was through the support of the patrons my 167 individual supporters who make such a big difference they contribute um between two dollars and 25 dollars every single month to help me fund the running costs so i just want to say a massive thank you to louise johnstone helen lacy Ellie Orford and Lydia Gould, who've all signed up to support the Tough Girl podcast in February, which is amazing. And it makes such a big difference to have this support. If you want to learn more about becoming a patron, then please do go check out Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Sign up. And if you sign up at the $5 amount, you can, you can come and join the Tough Girl tribe, which is a closed Facebook group for the female listeners of the Tough Girl podcast. It's an incredibly supportive environment. We have, uh, we run the book club through there. Thanks to Ali Mahoney, who's an absolute legend for doing that. We also, or, you know, we're there to support one another, to encourage, to motivate, to inspire, to ask those questions, to go to that place where you're not sure where to go. I mean, sometimes it can be very isolating doing, doing these challenges or wanting to lead a more adventurous life lifestyle and do things which are outside your comfort zone and sometimes you don't have the friends and family around you who maybe understand your your drive your motivation or your ambition come and join the tough girl tribe and you will get all the support that you need equally please do go check out the adventure queens there's also love her wild there's so many great closed facebook groups um on on facebook where you can get a lot of this support so it does make a real difference and this is all about women supporting women and i couldn't be prouder to help to promote anna and these other women on the tough girl podcast and help to get their stories out there and just to encourage more women and girls to step outside their own comfort zone and to take the next steps of their life on their journey and to really sort of encourage them to live their dreams and to live their life to the fullest please do subscribe to the tough girl podcast leave a review if you can i know it's a pain and it takes like 30 seconds or a minute to you know to log on to your itunes account and to and to leave a five-star review but it does make a difference it helps to get the the word out there i don't spend any money on advertising everything is done organically through word of mouth predominantly and it's amazing to see how far the tough girl podcast has grown we started it in august the 4th 2015 on August the 4th this year, it will be the third year anniversary. We're coming up to half a million downloads, 500,000 downloads, which is amazing. I can't wait to help celebrate that with you. To learn more about myself and Tough Girl Challenges, please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com. You can find all the links to my social media. You can find all of the other episodes of all the other women that I've interviewed and they are from all ages, all backgrounds, all stories, massive amount of variety, and it's only going to continue. So hit that subscribe button. Keep being inspired every single Tuesday. Thank you so much for your incredible support. It really does mean the world to me. Have an awesome day, and I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye. Bye.